Hi, and welcome to Kitchen Uncovered. I'm Chef Andrew Nicholson of the Culinary Institute of Canada. Today we're here with guest chef Kevin Boyce. Kevin, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. What are we doing today, and who? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, I am the program coordinator at the Culinary Institute of Canada. I've been here for about 10 years now, mm -hmm. uh, teaching and uh, taking care of the program. And uh, I've been living in PEI for 12 years now, originally from the Toronto area. All right, well, welcome to the show. Uh, what are we going to do today? Today we are going to talk about PEI mussels. Uh, we're going to do some steamed mussels. We're going to make a pesto crostini for a garnish. We're going to make a Spanish style cream sauce to uh, go with it. Okay, just some mm -hmm. different ways of cooking and some basics about, about mussels. Absolutely. Okay, so what can you tell us about the, the mussel itself? What makes it so spectacular? Well, PEI mussels, uh, first off they're blue mussels. And uh, anybody from away or from off island, if they uh, come to the island, they'll drive by these shallow inlets and bays and they see these long rows of buoys right. out in the water. Yep. Uh, these buoys have uh, mussels growing on them. And uh, what it is is we have a, a very strong aquaculture system within Prince Edward Island. And mm -hmm. along those buoys, You'll see it's just underneath the surface of the water. It's called a long line, mm -hmm. just basically a piece of rope that connects them all together. Okay. From that long line, underneath each buoy, you will see a frayed piece of rope like this with a lead weight. Hangs down from those lines. And what happens is when the mussels start to spawn, the uh, free floating baby mussels need something to cling onto mm -hmm. to grow. So they cling onto this rope and then they start to feed off all the natural plankton and algae okay. that you so find the in the water. So the rope a fishing net and basically catches, catches the mussels That's exactly floating right. through the water. Yep, mussels need something to cling onto. Now if they were wild mussels, uh, you could just walk along the beach and you'll see mussels clinging onto rocks and, right. yeah. and jetties and whatnot. So okay. Very cool. what happens in the growing process is once they start to get to approximately uh, half inch in size, mm -hmm then the mussel producers will take what's called a sock. And basically the sock is just a, a piece of netting. Yeah. And then they wrap that up over top of the rope. The rope to keep the mussels on the rope. That's exactly it. Yeah, keeps them on the rope, uh, keeps them away from predators. So they don't let that rope go down to the bottom and touch the uh, bottom of the bays. Okay. Uh, starfish are the biggest predators for mussels and uh, it just keeps them contained on the rope so they don't uh, fall off and uh, lose any. Okay. Now as they, cool. uh, as they grow, they'll start to work their way through that netting yep. and then they'll put another sock, just a larger in size, to around that piece keep of rope. Contained. Keep them contained. Okay, yep. so they grow in the sock so they don't get taken over by starfish or anything like that. They hang freely and they kind of feed off the plankton floating through through the water. So right. what makes PEI mussels so spectacular? Is it the water temperature or how do we? Absolutely, it's the water temperature. PEI mussels, they grow best in uh, cold water. So they'll even be uh, harvesting mussels in the middle of the winter. So when the bays ice over, they'll still break through the ice mm -hmm. to try and harvest those mussels. So the cold water uh, harvesting is, is uh, probably the best. Now they'll do this in the winter time. They'll break through the ice and, uh, and pull those up. Um, so the mussels, because of the cold water, the mussels in the winter are better than the ones obviously in the summer when the water's warmer because they need the cold water to... Correct. Yeah, and that gives them that nice clean flavor. Uh, the cold also helps them to harden their shell. Now there's okay. an interesting uh, part with the shells. If you uh, take a close look at them, you see these rings mm -hmm. across the shell. And it's just like cutting down a tree. You can count the rings to see how old that tree is by the year. Now with the rings on a mussel shell, average time of growth for a market sized mussel can be between 18 to 24 months okay. in time to grow them. And each ring is approximately one month of growth. Okay. Yep. Very good. Yep. So what about um, live mussels? We know we always got to cook lobsters live. Uh, mussels are better if they're cooked live. How do we tell the difference if a mussel is dead or alive? Anytime you cook mussels, you want to make sure that they are still alive. Now, this one's starting to close, but if you ever find a mussel that's open, you basically just squeeze that shell, mm -hmm. or you can just take your knife and just give it a little tap. It's just to wake it up, make sure that it's still alive. 
If it is, then just like this one just did, uh, the muscle shell will slowly start to close completely. Okay. If that muscle shell stays open, yeah. then more than likely that muscle is dead and you should just discard it. Okay. And the same thing when we cook them, it's a bit of a reverse. We, we cook mussels, when we steam them in the kitchen, we're typically looking for them to open up. So the mussels that don't open are the ones we should discard as well. Correct. So yep. it's kind of the reverse, reverse psychology. That's right. Okay. Yep. Very fascinating. So how do we prepare mussels? What's the most basic way and the easiest way for anybody at home to cook mussels? Easiest way to cook mussels is just to simply steam them. Steam them? Yep. Now, uh, Islanders do uh, things a little differently. Some people like to steam them in beer. Some people steam them in wine. Some people will use uh, salt water from the ocean. Mm -hmm. okay, but the easiest way to do it is just a small amount of liquid. Any savory ingredients you want to add to that liquid to add some flavor. Okay. And then you just steam them in a so covered it's pretty pot. much whatever you like as long as you're creating some moisture and not boiling them. Exactly. Okay, yep. so we're going to get started on a little bit. Yeah. I'll take that. So what we're going to do is very simple. We have clove of garlic. Okay. I'll just turn the... Thank you. We have a bay leaf. Okay. And we have some white wine. And that's it? That's it. So we're going to okay. add our white wine to the pot and just let that come to a quick simmer. Okay. So we start with a cool pot. We don't need a hot pot to start the steaming very... Yep, right it doesn't take much. Now a bay leaf, we add that to it uh, just to get a little extra fragrance to it. Bay leaves, when they're dry, mm -hmm. uh, it's a very floral taste and aroma to it. Yep. Slightly peppery, so it adds some nice uh, flavor to it. The garlic, uh, because it's just a steam product, we don't necessarily have to have it chopped. So I'll usually just take my knife and smash it. Just do a rough cut. Okay, so nothing very fine, just... Nothing very fine, because we just want to get that... Flavor and the juices out of it, just to kind of get the... Going That's through exactly the muscle. right. Get your liquid simmering, whether it's wine, beer, seawater. Okay. And you can just start to place your mussels in. Okay. You don't want to have too thick of a layer inside. Right. Otherwise, we get too much weight on top of the mussels, and it uh, makes it hard for them to open up. So we've got like less than a cup of less than a cup of liquid in there to steam these pound of mussels. That's exactly right. Right, just yep. enough to create some steam. Yep, and then we just cover that pot so we can keep the steam inside. Yeah, but how um, long will that take? Uh, you're looking maybe a minute. We don't want to overcook the mussels. Uh, once the shell is completely open, they're done. If you cook them longer, then they start to get very tough. Okay and uh, okay. unpalatable. Great, so we're gonna let these steam open up a little bit and when we come right back, we're gonna make some pesto and check on our muscles. Don't go away. This portion of Kitchen Uncovered has been brought to you by the Culinary Institute of Canada. For more information on their programs, you can visit hollandcollege.com. Community organizations and not-for-profit groups are invited to submit their announcements for free promotion on the Community One bulletin boards. Visit us at bellalliant.net slash community one. Welcome back to Kitchen Uncovered. I'm Chef Andrew Nicholson at the Culinary Institute of Canada. I'm here with Chef Kevin Boyce. Today we're talking PEI mussels and so far we've got uh, mussel steaming and what do we got going on now Kevin? We got some ingredients there for? Uh, we're gonna make some pesto. So we've, we've steamed our mussels. We're gonna let them uh, sit and stay warm for now. Okay. Uh, we're gonna make a pesto sauce. Now a pesto is basically a, a cold sauce. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an emulsion of ingredients. Uh, it's Mediterranean based, traditionally from Italy. Okay. Uh, pestos can be, traditionally, pesto is made with basil. Uh, we have some 
Parmigiano, Reggiano cheese, some olive oil, some fresh garlic, and some pine nuts. Okay. okay. There are variations of pestos out there. You can have a sun-dried tomato pesto. You could have a uh, pesto with made with different types of herbs if you want. Um, so lots of different variations around there. But traditionally, fresh basil and the, the and following ingredients. Okay. So what do we do? What do we? How do we put this together? We just kind of slam it all in the processor and go. Pretty much, yeah. It's, uh, it's a very simple process. So we've got our fresh basil. And what I'm going to do is just do a very rough chop on it. Okay, some okay, of the large so leaves. Okay, so it doesn't have to be precise by mm -hmm. any means. I'm just going to roughly cut that in. So you don't put the whole leaves in there because they might they might bruise a little bit. They you might want them bruise. kind of all broken up so they're all relatively the same size. That's exactly right. Some of the uh, basil, you just want to make sure that uh, you use the freshest basil possible. Mm -hmm. Some of the old basil, if it's uh, badly bruised, it can take on a bit of a bitter taste. So okay. the better the leaves, uh, the better the final. So product. freshly picked. Freshly make your basil. Picked. Don't wait till it starts to wilt in the fridge or something. That's exactly crazy. right. Yeah. So we have our basil in the uh, food processor. Mm -hmm. um, food processors are the easiest way to do it. Okay. If you don't have a food processor at home, some people have what's called a mortar and a pestle. You can simply place all these ingredients in the mortar and pestle and grind it up by hand if you okay. wish. So it's just puree and all the ingredients together basically to form the paste. That's correct. Okay. Yep. So would you toast your pine nuts or just use them fresh or was that kind of a personal preference? It's a personal preference. What I have here is just uh, fresh pine nuts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Toasting them brings out the oils in mm -hmm. them. It also gives a little bit of color, um, and you get that nice toasted flavor to it okay. if you so desire. Good. Yep. So we've got our fresh pine nuts. Just going to add those into it. Not too many. We have chopped garlic. Okay. Fresh, obviously. Fresh, yep. I like garlic, so I tend to put a little bit more in than. The so that's person. just roughly chopped a little bit finer than we did for the steam mussels, but just that's right. We don't not, want to go overpowering. Uh, we don't want to go too coarse, even though it's going into a food processor. Uh, sometimes the processor won't blend it down as small as we want it to be, so okay. uh, we just want to make sure that it gets ground in. All right. We are going to add some Parmesan cheese. Mm -hmm. Now, depending which type of Parmesan you use, this is called Parmigiano Reggiano. Okay. Okay. This is a true Italian Parmesan. And that kind of talks about the region a little bit too, because we have Parmigiano Padano too, that it's kind That's of right. similar, but it's just a different region yep. of where it's made. Sometimes Pecorino cheese will be used, depending on the regions of Italy that uh, it's being produced in. Um, when I don't add salt to my, uh, my pesto for the sole reason that because we are using Reggiano cheese, okay. it is slightly salty, okay, and different cheeses will change the level of saltiness right. to that pesto. Okay. So you have to be very cautious before you add salt to it, uh, taste it first and see if you actually even need it. Okay. Good to know. Last ingredient is tip. olive oil. Olive oil, basil, yep. parmesan and pine nuts, a little bit of garlic. And we simply it. just add all our ingredients to our food processor, lock it shut. Quick. And then we blend it. Very easy. And that's it. That's it. No heat, no cooking, no just blending and pasting and crushing. Yep. So with this product, okay. we're going to serve it onto a uh, toasted baguette. Okay. Okay. So I have one back here. Very simply what we're going to do, this is going to be a garnish for our mussel dish. Okay. So just on a slight angle, you're just going to cut the baguette into approximately quarter inch slices. Okay, just on the bias a little bit to give you a little bit of bite. Just on the you bias. You could just go straight across if you want it smaller, but this is yep. going to give you a bit of a plate Depending on the size you need. Okay. And then what we'll do is put them onto a sheet pan, mm -hmm. and we're just going to lightly toast those. Okay, we don't want to okay. do it too much because after it's toasted, we're going to spread the pesto on top. And then we're going to warm it again in the oven. Okay. Any seasoning or oil or anything on these before we put them in yep. the oven to toast them up? We can put a 
small amount of olive oil across each crostini. Not to soak them, just to flavor them a little just bit. Just to flavor them. And then a small amount of salt. Not too much, because same thing, our pesto is salty as it is right now. Okay, so we're gonna put these in the oven? Put those in the oven. And then we'll check on the mussels. So our mussels have been steamed, they're ready to go. Okay. So what we're gonna do, so they're all opened up. They're all opened up. So we know they were all good mussels. Yep. So what we want to do for this recipe, because we're going to be making a sauce, mm -hmm. we want to keep all of the liquid that's left over from our steaming. From steaming. Yep. We only added a quarter cup of liquid. We only added a quarter cup of liquid. So all that good flavor is left in the sauce. Drain that out. Okay. Just move that over so it doesn't drip. So we started with a quarter cup of liquid. We have a little bit more now because the natural nectar that comes out of the uh, mussels. The mussel juice, has actually yeah. strengthened it up. Okay. So depending on uh, how strong the sauce is or the stock is, yep. uh, we may actually put that in a pan and reduce it down so it concentrates the flavor. A little bit more? Yep. Gives it more, uh, more flavor to it. Okay. Very good. Okay, so we got the, the mussel juice, the baguettes are in the oven. When we come right back, we're gonna be making some mussel sauce, so don't go away. This portion of Kitchen Uncovered has been brought to you by the Culinary Institute of Canada. For more information on their programs, you can visit hollandcollege.com. Community organizations and not-for-profit groups are invited to submit their announcements for free promotion on the Community One bulletin boards. Visit us at bellalliant.net slash community one. Welcome back to Kitchen Uncovered. I'm Chef Andrew Nicholson at the Culinary Institute of Canada. I'm here today with Chef Kevin Boyce. Kevin's just grabbing the crostinis out of the oven. Uh, that we cut off the baguettes, that's for our pesto. We've got steamed mussels and we're gonna make a sauce. Make a sauce, yep. So our crostinis just came out of the oven and what we wanna do is, just very carefully, we're gonna okay. take our pesto that we've made and we just want to... Just a little bit on the toasted crostini. And we just season that with a little bit of olive oil. Yep, so we'll do that with every one of our crostinis. Okay. And then later on, we're going to warm them back up just before we finish plating. Okay, perfect. I'll finish those off. What's going on with the sauce, Kevin? Okay, so the sauce today, it's, uh, it's a cream-based sauce. We're using a variety of ingredients. We've got uh, a little bit of butter, some garlic, some diced shallots, some fresh cilantro and lime juice, mm -hmm. some heavy cream or whipping cream. And then we have some Roma tomatoes and some chorizo sausage. Chorizo sausage, What's, how does that fit into our mussels? Well, I'll tell you in one second here, I'm gonna put a little bit of butter into our pan. Okay. We're gonna get that warmed up. Now our chorizo sausage is a Spanish origin sausage. Mm -hmm. uh, in North America, we're used to uh, having fresh sausage. Um, because it's a, a Spanish origin, we have uh, different varieties coming from different regions around the world. Uh, Mexico has more of a spicier, fresh style sausage. It's usually traditionally smoked. Okay. Uh, down in Latin America, it's slightly spicy and it's fermented. When you get into the south of Spain and Portugal, same thing, it's a fermented sausage, but it's also dry cured. Okay, so, so different being, regions have different spices and Exactly. The aging yeah. processes. Um, the more dry cure you get, 
it takes on a bit of a harder texture, very similar to a pepperoni or salami. Okay. But it has a slight sour taste because it's fermented. So our butter's starting to heat up. What I'm going to do is take a little bit of garlic, put a teaspoon. Okay. So we're just sweating off the garlic and shallots here and a little bit of butter. We're not looking for high heat. We're just looking for something to get the juices, the juices going. Exactly. While that's slowly cooking, I'm just going to turn my okay. heat down. I'm going to take the chorizo sausage mm -hmm. and we're going to dice it. Put a large dice. Okay, nothing too small. Nothing too small. We want to still see the, the shape. We want it to be a dominant ingredient standing out. Butter's starting to brown there. Okay. So we're going to add our chorizo sausage to the pan. Okay. Stir that around. I'm going to lower my heat. Take our Roma tomato. Why Roma tomatoes? Roma tomatoes, I find they keep a nice firm texture, mm -hmm. slightly sweet. It adds good flavor to the product. Okay. Could you, you could use cherry tomatoes or beefsteak tomatoes if you had the choice or fresh from the garden. If so desired, yeah. Yep. Just like the firmness and the, and the plum tomatoes tend to have a little bit of uh, less seeds in them, more meaty. Absolutely. If I was using a different type of tomato with a larger type of that, I would actually remove the seeds from the product. Oh, okay. So you just want I the just meat of the tomato itself. Exactly. Okay. Just want to slowly cook that off, bring out the flavors of the sausage. It's a nice spicy sausage. All right. Not overpowering, but it adds some great flavor to the product. Okay. Now, earlier we had our mussel stock yep. that was left over from steaming the mussels. Okay, so we saved all the liquid from steaming the mussels. Yep. The white it's wine, the flavor. garlic. Yep, it's got great flavor from the wine, the garlic, the bay leaf, and especially the mussels. Okay, so and then we add that. Add that to our pan. Just enough to deglaze the pan, just like adding wine. Just like adding wine. We're just going to let that... So we let this cook and reduce. Is this something you could do ahead or is this something you like to do kind of last minute just before service type of thing? You can certainly have uh, mussel stock. Anytime you steam mussels, sometimes what I'll do at home is if I just have a, a basic batch of steamed mussels, I keep the liquid, I'll put it into a jar into my fridge, okay. and then I save it for a later date. And if I decide I want to make a sauce to go with those mussels, yeah. then I have that stock ready to go. Okay. How long would that keep in your fridge? Is that something you could freeze as well if you didn't see anything coming up in the near future? Absolutely, you could freeze it off and it's got uh, infinite lifetime. If it's sitting in your fridge, I would say no more than uh, a week, week and a half at the most. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. So we're slowly reducing down. Yep. Now what I'm going to do is add my cream. So we reduce the liquid by about half. We get chorizo sausage, the garlic, shallots, butter, and tomato. And now whipping cream. So 36%. Something fairly heavy? Something fairly heavy. I'd say no less than 34%. Okay. And, and that's for separation or just consistency issues? A little bit of both. The, the less fat that you have inside the cream, uh, it's going to take a lot longer to thicken and it's also going to set yourself up for the possibilities of it separating from Okay. It. Yep. Great. So while that starts to simmer up, yep. you can see it's starting to thicken as we speak. So we want to reduce to concentrate all the flavors that are in the pan and concentrate to a sauce consistency. That's correct. Nice and thick. We want the finished sauce to be able to coat the back of a spoon. Okay. Okay. So when I say coat the back of a spoon, I should be able to run my finger through that and it doesn't fill in. So that's still a little bit thin right now. Okay. Nice trick. The last ingredient we have is uh, cilantro, uh, okay. commonly used in a lot of uh, Spanish dishes. Cilantro and uh, coriander mm -hmm. is another name for it, fresh coriander. Uh, this gets confused a lot because actually cilantro leaves grow from coriander seeds. Okay, and so they so have similar, similar aspects as far as flavor goes, but yep. okay. Yep. So if you see a recipe that says for fresh coriander, then it's actually the cilantro leaves you want. 
Right. If the recipe just calls for coriander, then it's usually just the seed. The seed they're looking for. That's correct. Okay. Okay. So that's almost done. All right. So we just finished the sauce. Just finished the sauce. And I think what we'll do is we'll warm up our uh, pesto crostinis just very quickly. Okay. And I'll then we'll plate up our mussels. All right. You can plate those up and I'll put these in the oven. So we've got our mussels that are nice and warm, held mm -hmm. from the steam. Something that's very important whenever you're presenting mussels is you should always present them with the open side up. Okay. okay. Up to the customer or up to the consumer. Okay, and there is a reason for this. One, it looks very nice presentation-wise. Mm-hmm. Okay, the other reasons are it keeps the meat in the shell. If yep. we just dump this bowl, then a lot of meat will, will fall, fall out, of the, out shell, of the shell. Right? They're upside down. So if right. we present them open side up. Nobody likes getting empty shells in their plate. Nobody likes empty shells. And especially when you serve it with a sauce. Yeah. With these open shells, it means each muscle is going to catch a bit of that sauce. Okay. Right? So you get all that goodness inside each muscle. Okay, so we got a couple yeah. empty shells, but they all had muscles when they went in, so they gotta have muscles now. Yep, so that's looking pretty good. Okay. Our sauce is thickening up. I'm gonna add at the very last second a little bit of lime juice. Okay, lime just juice. Just to give it a bit of acidity. And it's also an alternative to adding salt to a product. If you use an acid instead of salt, mm -hmm. acids uh, act the same way as salt. It's a flavor enhancer. Okay. But with less sodium going into the product. Right. I'm just going to grab those crostinis. Okay. So what we'll do, same kind of philosophy with the sauce as it mm -hmm. is with the mussels. We don't want to just pour it over the top. Okay. We want it to be nice and clean presentation. Beauty. So you can take a spoon. It smells great. Or a ladle. Make sure it gets it over those muscles. filled in to all those muscles. And then we get all this lovely garnish, with the sausage and the tomatoes and the cilantro, making sure it goes into every muscle shell. Beautiful. And then the pesto crostinis. And then the pesto crostinis. So it's all about presentation. So we've got our muscles open side up. We've got our sauce on top. Just finish it with a little pesto crostini, just to give something crunchy to consume with the mussels. Right on. Added flavor with the pesto, and then you have a very uh, sexy dish of steamed mussels with Spanish sauce. It is that. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you for Thanks for a PEI Mussel Journey. Thank you for joining us. Any of the information on today's show, or the, check out our website, kitchenuncovered.com. I'm Chef Andrew Nicholson at the Culinary Institute of Canada. Thanks for watching.